Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Well, our subject, without doubt, it's a subject that is a religious one, isn't it? And a very fundamental subject at that, too. Because the devil certainly is a crucially important subject for any Christian denomination, whatever that understanding and whatever the doctrine about the devil is within any given Christian faith. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this subject from the Bible and we believe as Christadelphians that the Bible is the inspired word of God and that the Bible therefore is the only authority for belief and knowledge about God and of his son Jesus Christ. Now for many centuries the word the devil to most people, that would conjure up to them, in, in their minds, a picture of a personal and powerful being. The devil was and has often been depicted as half man, half beast. Uh, a being perhaps pictured with, with horns, hooves, a long tail, perhaps covered in hair, and maybe also carrying a three-pronged fork. This being apparently lives beneath the earth, presiding over dead souls, and that he torments those souls in the flames of hell. Sometimes he leaves this pl that place and walks throughout the earth, being the source of evil in the earth, responsible for luring people to do all sorts of evil. Well, today, most people wouldn't perhaps think of the devil in quite such de descriptive terms. However, the, the popular Christian belief about the devil, even today, is that the devil does literally exist. Perhaps the most common belief is that the devil is a fallen angel. That is, that one of the angels of heaven, one of God's angels, who rebelled against him, against God, and as a consequence, has therefore been cast out of heaven. And some believe that there were other angels who followed the devil in that rebellion. But today, as we say, that, that belief still regards the devil as a source of evil, if not the source of all evil and wickedness in the earth, still responsible then for tempting men and women to sin against God. And certainly when we come to the Bible, sometimes passages can perhaps give the impression on our first reading of them that the devil is a personal and individual being. But we do stress that again. At first reading, at first glance, on the surface that is, a Bible verse might suggest the devil exists as a real being. But when we look more closely at that passage and then take into account the, the context of the passage and overall Bible teaching, then we will find that the devil is not actually what we perhaps thought at first. Now in the passage that we've read together through our president already, we have a prime example of this. So let's look at that, at that again, at Hebrews chapter 2. And of course the, the devil is mentioned in this chapter, isn't it? It's in verse 14 of chapter 2 there. Uh, and the last part of that verse, where it, it stated something quite, quite remarkable. It says there in verse 14, uh, halfway through the verse, how that through death, that is Jesus, might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So yes, here we have uh, a reference to the devil in the Bible, but the sentence also describes the devil as he, uh, which understandably at first we might conclude that the devil is a person, or at least a being of some kind, and a male one at that. But it's when we take a further look at this, and, and, and when we take some time just to think these words through, then we find that things aren't what they seem to be on the surface. That very phrase itself, you see there, how that Jesus through the death that he died on the cross, well, that has actually destroyed the devil. Of course, when someone 
or something is destroyed, it's completely gone, hasn't it? It does not exist anymore. Now, as we say, this is quite remarkable. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ has destroyed the devil. And the power of the devil, it says here, which the writer tells us is, is death, the power of the devil is death, well, in some way, death has also been destroyed or bro broken or destroyed. So what we're beginning just to see then is that the Bible teaching does not fit with this popular understanding about the devil. Because if the devil is a literal being, then what the Bible is actually saying about it there is that he no longer exists. And how can he still continue to wield power, uh, the power of death, if he was destroyed at the very moment that Jesus died on the cross some 2,000 years ago? So, as we say, these things don't really add up, do they? But the Bible explains itself. We as Christadelphians believe that it is God's word. It's inspired by the Almighty God and that what might appear at first maybe to be contradictory, in fact it, it, it isn't and it provides the answer for us. So we think again about this particular verse and, and as we say there's something that really doesn't tie up about the way Jesus has destroyed the devil if that is the devil is a powerful being, perhaps a fallen angel. Now, without doubt, the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ was to destroy the devil. So we might say then, well, wouldn't it have been far better if Jesus had been given a strong nature, we might say, an immortal nature, like the angels, for instance? But it was completely the opposite, wasn't it? Because the first half of that verse, verse 14, says, actually says it was because Jesus was a man, a mere mortal we might say, that, that he did this. And, and, and how could Jesus prepare himself for battle or for war against such a powerful enemy by having human nature, that Jesus was flesh and blood, we might say? And then how could Jesus actually destroy this powerful being by suffering the ultimate thing which defines our mortality, death. Surely wouldn't that suggest that the devil had actually won this, this battle, this war, once his mortal opponent, Jesus Christ, died? So obviously they, these are questions that we need to address. And as we say, the Bible does, does explain these things. Perhaps the first thing we consider is, is in fact not entirely obvious, uh, but it is in this chapter. And you see, the, the, the original New Testament was uh, written in Greek, you see. Uh, Greek was the universal language at the time. So the word devil then is from a Greek word. Uh, it's the Greek word diabolos. Uh, and you see, the word diabolos has a meaning, of course, and it means a false accuser or a slanderer. So what we can immediately see then is that it's not a name. It's not a name of a person or a, an individual being. Uh, it, it, it's literally, this phrase applies to any individual who acts or behaves in that way. So let's just look at the context of this chapter then. Because as we say, there's, there's, there's some clues here that can help us to set us on our way. And in verse 1, uh, there's a, as I say, there's a small clue. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now, yes, this is only a very small clue, but um, the writer there speaks about we, doesn't he? Uh, that is... Is writing to believers in Christ here and he's saying that if disciples of Christ if we he says if we let the things of the gospel slip from us then we are responsible for that he's saying so it's only them that's responsible if, if that happens not anybody or anything else is responsible and he says it in another way in verse 3 he says for how shall we escape if we neglect the salvation that is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
So it's we again, isn't it? But what is it exactly that we need to escape from that he, he, he describes there? Well, again, the passage itself indicates it in verse 9, when it speaks in verse 9 of how Jesus tasted death for every man. And in verse 15, how that through the death of uh, Jesus, uh, of course in verse 14 there, and verse 15, how that he might then deliver those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And then in the last two verses, something quite significant there as well. Uh, verse 17, Wherefore, in all things it behoved Jesus to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that Jesus himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succour them that are tempted. So, sin then is right at the heart of this subject of the devil. And again, this passage indicates that it's the sin of the people. Nobody else indicated there, is there? Those sins, in other words, belong, we could say, to those people who commit those sins. It's their sins. So we must consider these things as a whole then, taking all scripture, relevant scripture, into consideration before we make any conclusions. Now one very helpful way to, for us to try to understand any Bible passage, that is if we might not understand that Bible passage at, at first, is to see if there's another passage that says very much the same thing, but perhaps in slightly different terms. And more often than not, we'll find then that when we compare those passages together, they actually throw light on each other. And this particular verse 14 does indeed echo, we might say, very much with another passage. It's in the same book. It's in chapter 9 of Hebrews. And uh, just keep a finger in chapter 2. We're going to compare uh, some phrases here from chapter 9. Now, uh, in this chapter, um, he was writing again about the priesthood of Israel and how the high priest of Israel was an intermediary between Israel, the people of Israel, and God himself, of course. Now, the high priest would offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. <clears throat> but the writer here also shows that how that Jesus Christ has, <clears throat> has now become the one true high priest between God and men. So, um, let's just, just for connection, let's look at verse 11 of chapter 9. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So, the Bible's saying then that there is a very important link with the sacrifice of Jesus and how that has made Jesus a perfect high priest and how in turn that is how Jesus has obtained eternal redemption for us or for believers in Christ. So now let's actually look at that phrase that we want to, really want to look at in verse 26. Actually from verse 24 we'll read. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must Jesus often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So that's that phrase there at the end of verse 26, how that he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now let's just go back quickly to chapter 2 and compare that with that verse again 
14, verse 14 of chapter 2. How that through his death, Jesus might destroy the devil. And again, chapter 9, verse 26, that Jesus hath put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now that really is saying the same thing, isn't it? The same thing as, as through his own death, back in chapter 2. So the other phrases, the other terms we might say, in those two passages, those two verses, they must also correspond with each other. So therefore, destroying the devil is, a, is the same thing, another way of saying, putting away sin. So this parallel phrase sheds light on the devil in chapter 2 verse 14 so the devil therefore must be a way of how the bible describes human rebellion we might say against god and the bible calls that sin well as i'm sure you will have guessed already there are many other passages many other echoes to these here in hebrews and again these will be crucial in helping us to unlock the truth about this subject. So we'll now turn to Romans chapter 5. Because what we can now do, having looked at those two uh, verses in, in Hebrews, we can now test out, we might say, the meaning that those two verses have given us. And we can see whether those conclusions about those verses are right. Because we can now ask a question, you see. We can say, well, does the Bible tell us what it is that possess it, possesses this power that we've read about in Hebrews? Well, Romans chapter 5 has the answer for us. Uh, and it's in verse 21. Romans chapter 5, verse 21. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So remember in Hebrews chapter 2, the devil had the power of death. But here we're told that sin reigned in death. Now if someone or if something reigns, then it has power of course, doesn't it? Just as a ruling monarch rules over his or her subjects. Perhaps not quite the situation today in, in our country, of course, but things have changed, haven't they? But both passages then are clearly speaking about the same thing. They're describing who or what has power over death. So the devil and sin must be one and the same thing. Or to put it another way, the devil is just another way of describing sin. Now in chapter 6 of Romans, we've got another phrase that again agrees and echoes with this one. Chapter 6, and it's the last verse of that chapter, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So there, sin is likened to a master. A master, of course, who rules over a slave or a servant and this master pays wages the reward for sin is death and there's another way in which all these phrases are linked together it's in how that they are all they all portray that which had power over death which is sin because it's portraying it sin as as if it's a person and there is a term for that it's personification so for example we often refer to a ship or a sailing vessel as, as her, don't we, or as a she. Uh, and that's using this idea of personification. And in fact, the Bible uses it elsewhere. So, for example, in the book of Proverbs, it describes the concept of wisdom. The idea of wisdom, again, as a woman. So the Bible there is using this idea in describing sin as if it was a real person. So what the Bible is really telling us is that the real devil is actually sin. And there's another, another important link here with Hebrews that we looked at. Remember that Hebrews described those who were under sin were also 
in bondage or therefore they were in bondage well here in Romans you see the Apostle Paul there who wrote that letter he said exactly the same thing there isn't he how that it's actually sin which is the master and those that serve sin are in bondage to it and the just reward of sin is death but he says there's hope doesn't he there is a way to be saved from sin and death but that way of salvation is actually the gift of God it's not something that can actually be earned and we'll look at that wonderful hope just uh, a bit later on what we need to concentrate on now though is on sin and what sin is and crucially where sin originates from now I'm sure most people are aware of the idea of sin in, in, in its general terms uh, how that sin generally means something which is wrong something that's morally wrong perhaps we might say but the problem is, you see, uh, is, if, is if we leave God out of this consideration, then the difference then becomes less clear. In other words, something, you see, that uh, well, I might consider to be wrong, you may not consider that to be wrong, or vice versa, of course. And sometimes we can be influenced by other people's view, can't we? Particularly a widely held view. So others might say, we don't actually see anything wrong or any harm in doing such, such a, or such a thing. Or we hear the phrase, we should just go with the flow. So mankind in general tends to do that, tends to follow its own way, the general feeling amongst itself, its own viewpoint on what is right and wrong. And so often that leads to different attitudes and it causes confusion. That's because, as we say, God is being left out of the consideration. But if there is a God, if we believe in a creator, then that means there is then only one opinion that matters to us. There is only then one viewpoint, only one voice that we should hearken to. And therefore it is that one moral standard that we should make as our own. In fact, there was a period in Bible history in the Old Testament when God's people, Israel, were described as doing that which was right in their own eyes. And that period in their history was, well, quite frankly, it was chaos. They had forgotten and abandoned God's ways, God's laws, and they did whatever they thought was right, every individual. So sin is what is wrong in God's sight. That's the important thing. Now the word itself means an offence. So to sin means to break God's law. It means to commit anything, any offence that is morally wrong in his sight. Now where does sin come from then? In fact, where does temptation to sin originate? Well, the Bible is very clear on this. An Old Testament example is in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. God here himself answers this, ex this exact question here for us. So Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. God says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. The heart of man. It's man that is deceitful above all things. It's not the heart of a powerful individual being. No, it's the very heart which we all have. And it, it has the capacity we might say or the propensity to be deceitful above anything else that exists man is the creature that is desperately wicked above all things now to add to this there are many other passages that we could look to so for instance uh, the prophet Isaiah he wrote that all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned every one to his own way and the Apostle Paul quoted from the Old Testament. He said that all men are under sin. As it is written, 
There is none righteous, no, not one. And there is none that doeth good, no, not one. And in fact, if we turn to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Mark and chapter 7, chapter 7, sorry, where the Lord Jesus Christ is also very precise, we might say, about the heart of man. So Mark chapter 7, verse 21. For from within, said Jesus, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, <clears throat> adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Yes, all those evil things there originate from men's thoughts, from men's hearts. So just as God stated through Jeremiah, well, Jesus here confirms where sin comes from. There is nothing worse than the heart of man. And turning on to uh, James, the uh, letter of James in chapter 1, we can see the process of sin. Uh, that is, how temptation to sin arises in us and how we can go on then to, to actually sin. So uh, James, and it comes after Hebrews, James chapter 1 and verse uh, 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So God never tempts anyone to sin. Who does then, we might ask? Is it a supernatural <coughs> devil? No. Temptation to sin comes from every individual man and woman, as we've seen. And James again uh, says this in verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So temptation to do sin and then sin itself is laid, we could say, solely at the feet of every individual man and woman who commit their own sins. So it is the lust or the desires of our own hearts that tempt us into sin. But at this point we might ask, well, does the fact that we have this desire then to, to lead us into sin, the fact that we've got that within us, is it that we're counted sinners by God just by that fact? And also, what if we can actually resist temptation? Well, let's look at verse 12. It says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So, what's quite clear then is that God does not hold somebody guilty if they resist temptation on the contrary if someone resists the desire of their own heart to do sin if they don't actually then go on to sin then in fact is it saying they are blessed of God not condemned by him they're blessed but of course if we are enticed by that temptation of our heart and when lust has conceived as it describes it here then we course give in to that temptation and we have then indeed committed a sin against God so you see we're beginning then to see what Jesus actually destroyed it was not an individual being called the devil in reality it was sin but how did Jesus do that well remember how Hebrews chapter 2 said that Jesus himself was tempted. So let's go back to Hebrews, this time to chapter 4. We find another explanation here of, of what Jesus accomplished, you see. Verse 
And, and we're again reminded of how Jesus is a high priest and why that role that he has, that he fulfills as high priest, why that is so important to this subject that we're considering. So chapter 4 and verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Well, the role of a, of a priest is, of course, to identify with the people whom he represents, and then he seeks to reconcile those people to God. And so here, it's very clear that Jesus is not a high priest that doesn't understand or that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities because he, he has been touched with them. So Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted because he was tempted. He was tempted in all points, it says here. In every possible temptation then that's known to man, he has experienced that. But the remarkable difference with him is that he never succumbed to those temptations he was without sin. But we might ask then, where did the temptation Jesus experienced, where did that come from? Well, we've seen, haven't we, that it comes from the human heart. It's the heart of man that's deceitful and wicked above all else. So the Lord Jesus Christ was tempted in all ways by that same nature, the nature that we have, that heart, we might say, that he shares with us and yet as we say he was without sin now we saw uh, in James there the apostle James wrote that each and every one of us is tempted when we're drawn away by our own lust our own desires that capacity we might say was within the Lord Jesus Christ the difference between him and us is that he did not give in he never sinned so that's why James wrote that blessed is the man that endures temptation. Jesus is the most blessed man, isn't he? So when Jesus then, for example, was driven into the wilderness and was tempted of the devil, he was being tempted by that nature that we could say he shares with us. Those temptations arose from within himself. The difference is that he, he crushed them and overcame them all. Now if we experience temptation and yet not give way to that, to it, then it means that we've overcome that temptation. What we can never be able to do though is to overcome all temptation. Jesus did. And that's what makes what he did so remarkable. And it's that perfect life that he lived that pleased God his Father. Indeed, he is blessed, isn't he? Because he endured all temptation. But there was more, in fact, that Jesus had to accomplish that God wanted him to do. It was his Father's will that Jesus should offer up his perfect life in sacrifice. So there, then, was something that no other high priest could ever have done. Because Christ is the only perfect, sinless man. So the sacrifice of Jesus Christ destroyed that human sinful nature that was within himself he completely overcame it by his life of obedience to his father we might say that human nature had been nailed to the cross and so the power of death sin was destroyed in the person of Jesus Christ and because of that God raised him from the dead and Jesus now has an immortal nature and a nature that no, is no longer subject to temptation. So Jesus is now a perfect high priest because he understands what it's like for us. And we can then draw encouragement from his example and endeavour to resist our own nature. The Apostle Paul described this as being in the battle, like as being in a war, that we must fight this battle within ourselves. So it isn't a battle then uh, between ourselves and an external individual being. No, it's, it's us ourselves, it's our own nature that we are at war with. 
And there is a, a clearly laid out process which we must follow if we are going to overcome sin. First of all, we must believe. We must then repent and be baptised. And turning back to Romans now, uh, in fact to chapter 6, which we just touched on, didn't we? Um, we see that the ideas that we've discovered are brought together in the idea of baptism into Christ. So Romans chapter 6. Baptism, you see, signifies the death of Christ and his resurrection. So chapter 6 and verse 3. And not only, sorry, verse 3 of chapter 6. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So what baptism represents then is that when... When somebody's baptised, when somebody, in other words, has made a life decision, we might say, to follow Christ, well, they then must endeavour to overcome sin in their lives. But this cannot be achieved perfectly, as it was by Christ himself. But this is what baptism is, is also for, you see. Because in God's sight, when somebody's baptised into Christ, that person's sins are washed away by the sacrifice of Christ. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Jesus, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So when somebody's baptised, in that sense, their old person, their old man is put to death. So in other words, they, as we say, they've made that decision in their lives to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are then going to try to destroy sin in their own flesh. And then from that point onwards, they no, must no longer serve sin. Serving sin is what we would naturally do if we were to follow what's right in our own eyes. But by following Christ's example, then we're seeking after righteousness for what is right in God's sight. And again, we notice this connection that we've seen before in those passages, how that we should not serve sin. See that in verse, verse 6 there. So the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that sacrifice, destroyed the devil. That means we can be released from bondage. But it's not that we're in bondage to a personal individual being called the devil. No, in Christ we're freed from our own nature, our nature of sin. This means we have a wonderful hope. Verse 8. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So we've got that hope of eternal life, which of course Jesus has now, doesn't he? He's received that from God. And we can see it again in verse 9 here. Knowing that Christ is being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. So we want to leave that hope with you now. We can all share in eternal life. In Christ, we're freed from that power of sin and death. But to do that, we must think of ourselves as being dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ. We must each acknowledge that the only personal devil is the one within ourselves. So we must recognise that the enemy is in fact the nature that we all share. And then we must set about to destroy our own devil.